Mann has had many solo exhibitions, including at 18th Street Art Center, Art Pay San Antonio, and received numerous awards, including California Community Foundation Artist Fellowship and a Stone and DeGuire Contemporary Art Award and others. Please join me in welcoming Ilana Mann. Thank you, that was a really beautiful introduction. Thanks so much, Ryan, for inviting me. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I was trained as a sculptor, but I've always been oriented towards sound, human communication, and the act of listening. Uh, when I was in school, as you are now, <laughs> I spent most of my time hanging out with the experimental composers in the music department, and I would get scolded for not taking enough visual arts classes. Uh, I have little formal musical training, but I grew up with family members that have sound processing disorders. Uh, that means my family understands and hears sound differently than most people. My oldest child was also born with this difference. When he was a baby, most loud and mechanical sounds made him cry. So now he wears noise dampening headphones in certain settings um, and he has to listen harder than most kids his age to hear and comprehend language. Growing up, I didn't know that my family members had sound processing disorders, but I knew that they behaved differently towards sound and language than other people around me. And this early observation that individuals can hear the world in very distinct ways sparked in me a deep interest and passion for sound. So here is a silkscreen poster from 2016 with a question that drove my work for many years. What does listening look like, both in function, in form, and within politics? And in the poster, you can see examples of listening, such as the letter T-shaped drone um, and the N-shape made up of the punk rock feminist protest band Pussy Riot. As a young artist, I didn't know yet uh, how to translate my ideas about sound into form and image. Um, sound is physical. You can feel sound waves moving through your body, but it is also invisible and ephemeral. And it's not typical fodder for visual artists. So I began to comb art history, popular culture, and the history of music to find references or points of departure for my work. One of the artists who I encountered in my research is the queer Tejana composer and musician Pauline Oliveros, pictured here. Oliveros' work changed my life and my art. She invented a way of engaging with sound she calls deep listening, which draws a distinction between hearing and listening. She theorizes that hearing is passive. You can't close your ears and sound just flows in. While listening is active, you can pay attention and digest certain sounds and tune other ones out. Oliveros explores active listening through sonic meditations, group sound making, and improvisation. She began developing her deep listening technology after witnessing a man set himself on fire um, in protest of the Vietnam War. So there's a palpable, palpable political undercurrent to her theory and music. In my research, I became fascinated with the history of listening technologies from the past to the present. The shape of early spying tools, 19th century hearing aids, satellite dishes, evoke the way sound travels through space with their shape and form. Many of these devices can both project and receive sound, and I desperately wanted to know what they sounded like. So I recreated various pre-radar listening devices from World War I. On your um, left, you have an ear to tuba, which was used to listen for oncoming airstrikes. And on the right is my recreation from 2013, using antique uh, megaphones from the same era. 
in 2013 was also the year that whistleblower Edward Snowden leaked highly classified documents from the National Security Agency, which revealed uh, US global surveillance programs. And so when I was making the sculpture, I was grappling with the negative aspects of state-sponsored listening as it relates to spying, surveillance, and violation of privacy. This sculpture that I made was um, right near the airport, and you could really hear the low rumbling of the plane. So it, was, it functioned in the same way as the original one was intended. And at the time that it was used, World War I, World War II, there was no, it wasn't as loud um, in the world. And so these, these machines were actually very functional and useful. Um, I also grew fascinated with antique hearing aids. And before these devices were electronic, they used passive technology of sa sound transmission through bell and conical shapes. And here is an image of two women using an ear trumpet from 1955. I collected <laughs> many of these ear trumpets um, and accrued a selection of 18. And these hearing aids were made before mass production. Each one was unique um, and created for a certain ear in mind. So you can see early examples of materials industrial materials in these objects, some of which are made from plant cellulose or rubber, not the petroleum-based plastics we use today. So that was really interesting for me when I was collecting them. Um, and then others are really intricate and unique and reflect the fashion of the time. Um, so like this, the, one, the bottom um, one made of silver. So I wanted to make my own uh, handheld listening device, and I created a prototype of the sculpture made of cast plastic, and I used it in a workshop at the Getty Villa. As you can see, there's a hole in the palm of the hand, and it connects to an interior chamber of the arm to the bell of a trumpet. I was thinking about my grandfather um, who actually, this is my step-grandfather, um, he was involved in the Manhattan Project um, and had a huge, that having that person in my family like had a huge influence in me becoming really like a force for, towards peace. <laughs> um, and he, y he was hard of hearing and he used to cup his hand around his ear like this. Um, and so I, I made this device thinking about him um, with a cast of my own hand. And uh, on, the, on the right, you can see a workshop attendee using the device to listen to sounds in the Geta Villa garden. So museums are also sites of sound, not just visual information. And I called this sculpture a histophone. Histo is the Greek word for something related to organic tissue and phone is the ancient Greek term for sound, voice, speech, and language. During the workshop, I saw this participant using my sculpture in a way that I had never intended. She put the device to her mouth to amplify her own voice. She's just like experimenting with it. And when you make artwork that invites participation as I do, you never really know how people are going to interact with your work. And for some artists, this is terrifying. And yes, my sculptures have been misused and even broken, which is heartbreaking. But for me, activating my sculptures with other people means that I am constantly learning about the objects, about human beings, about the world. And this creates endless excitement, curiosity, and interest. So when I saw this woman using my sculpture as a megaphone, it just sparked so many new ideas for my artwork. And I eventually made another sculpture with a similar idea, um, but this time there is a bigger bell and it faces forward. And I called this sculpture Call to Arms and it's from 2016. 
And there, the histophones I ended up finishing and painted shades of purple and blue and red to reference bruises. Both sculptures magnify and distort the human voice when someone sings or speaks into them, and they're each made in an addition of 10 to invite group use. After I made Call to Arms, I was reminded of a Jewish ritual object that I grew up with called a shofar, which you can see in this image. A shofar is a ram's horn whose sound is supposed to have metaphysical powers to heal ailments, frighten enemies, and awaken the spirit. And in Israel, when there's like a big flu epidemic or something, they fly planes across the country blowing shofars. Um, to try to get the ailment or the sickness to go away. Um, Judaism, for those of you that aren't from that culture, is a completely oral, aural, and textual culture uh, whose main prayer starts with the word Shema, which means listen. It does not have a native visual culture of its own, so any Jewish imagery is cold or assimilated from the culture that Jews were living in. And there's even laws against certain kinds of visual representation. And as a child, I was fully immersed in this Jewish culture of orality. I didn't even have a single non-Jewish friend until the age of 12 when I moved from a religious school to a public school. And I sort of lived outside of Western culture. I remember going to my first Catholic friend's house and seeing Jesus on the cross and just being like, um, which is a very unique and weird childhood um, in the United States in the 20th and 21st century. Um, so I, luckily, my family was part of a congregation that practiced liberation theology. Uh, so it was a feminist and humanist kind of Judaism called Reconstructionism. And I remember the elders of our congregation rewriting patriarchal prayers and altering misogynistic rituals to make them more egalitarian. I learned at an early age that the world around me was mutable and even a 5,000-year-old religion could be changed to make a more moral moral, just, equal, and inclusive society. So this had a huge influence on my ideas about activism, organizing, and movement building. In 2017, I started using my sculptures and performances and street protests. And I, uh, along with being an artist, I'm also an activist and organizer. And sometimes those paths intersect, like in this image here, and sometimes they don't, and I just like you know, a community organizer on my, in my free time. Uh, so this image is taken from a May Day March advocating for international workers' rights. I called these actions, take a stand marching band. And sometimes it was just me, and oftentimes it involved over 20 people activating my sonic sculptures. Take a stand marching band never rehearsed but we use the megaphones to highlight and uplift chants or phrases from the crowd. Seeing people use my sculptures really creates a visual dissonance because the speaker's mouth is covered, uh, but their voice is magnified. And this sculpture represents political powers attempting to silence voices, voices that are desperately trying to be heard, and yet the sculpture reveals that the human voice is very resilient, and it can rise up against all odds. Oop. I often collaborate with professional musicians um, to activate my sonic sculptures. And this image is from a musical performance in one of my gallery installations. It's from an opera called Unseal Unseen. And uh, the opera was about violence against women and included an aria called Silent Room that used my sculpture. The, the composers are Sharon Chohi Kim and Michaela Tobin. The performance that uh, is pictured here um, was this crazy coincidence. It happened th in 2018, the week of Dr. Blasey Ford and Brett Kavanaugh hearings. 
um, in which Dr. Blasey Ford described being sexually assaulted by Kavanaugh when she was a teenager, and she included a description of um, trying to scream out and Kavanaugh covering her mouth, um, which also happens in the performance. So it was a really weird, cathartic, amazing moment of art and life blending. And I'm gonna show a, a video excerpt of the performance uh, as a sexual assault survivor myself, I just want to be sensitive to people here, so I'm just going to describe what you're going to see. The video has three performers singing into my sculptures and covering their own mouth. It ends with the performers screaming. Uh, you're welcome to close your eyes or leave if you think it'll be triggering for you. And the video is approximately two minutes long. So I'm just going to play that video now. <laughs> I don't know. Let's see. Yeah. Um. Uh -oh. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so many people asked me whether the sound was ma magnified in the performance. 
And there's no electronic amplif amplification, so the sounds you hear are the sounds from the sculptures themselves. Um, but they did have contact mics just to record the sound that were taped to the back. The sculptures can actually be quite loud in the hands of someone who knows how to project their voice. Besides working with musicians, I often collaborate with activists, which is sometimes tricky because art moves slow and activism moves very quickly and is ever-changing, but I love working with activists and I always learn so much from them. In 2018, I made these two posters with a feminist activist group called Tomorrow Girls Troop that is based in Japan, Korea, and China. And Tomorrow Girls Troop has waged many successful campaigns where they've changed sexual abuse laws and also altered misogynistic dictionary definitions. It's not safe for them to be public figures, so they wear masks and they take on pseudonyms to protect their identities. And because of this, it was really hard to find people that were willing to pose for the poster. <laughs> um, it was also difficult to figure out a slogan that would work in both Japanese and in English, but we ended up with this 1976 campaign slogan um, from the Tennessee Congresswoman Annabelle Clement O'Brien, a woman's place is in the House and the Senate, and the Japanese version was gender equity at home and in politics. And we ended up printing these posters before the 2018 midterm election when more women were elected to Congress than ever before. So that was exciting. The poster has been used in different activist contexts. Uh, here is an image from a rally in Osaka, Japan in 2019 on April 10th. This is a yearly event uh, to mark the day in 1946 when Japanese women voted for the first time. So much, much after uh, women were able to vote in the US. Um, and these activists are agitating for a new law mandating that Japanese elected officials be half female and half male. Um, in 2019, I started making protest rattles with ceramic heads and wooden handles. I, I wanted something to bring with me to rallies and demonstrations that um, would amplify my presence because I have a really quiet voice. And so I just made two at first. One said yes, one said no, and it was really just for me as a personal object. But once I started using them, I really was surprised and delighted by their impact and how they added a sense of play and celebration and energy to the demonstrations that I was attending. After I started making them, I recognized that these instruments were partly inspired by a Jewish ritual object called a grogger that's played during the holiday of Purim. Um, and you can see an example of a grogger at the bottom right hand corner of this image. The grogger's noise is meant to drown out the name of an evil villain, Haman, um, when the story of Purim is read out loud. Haman tried to wipe out the entire Jewish population of a city called Shushan that's in modern day Iran. And this brave heroine, Queen Esther, speaks up to save her people. So the whole, um, the whole holiday really is about the power of sound and the need to use one voice to protect oneself and one's community against danger and injustice. So I expanded this series, and I'm still <laughs> making rattles. I just love them. Um, I have over, I've made over 70 rattles now. Um, I don't have all of them, but uh, here's an image of many of them installed in a gallery exhibition. They each have a unique combination of color and shape. They're all filled with different materials, such as wood, metal, glass, ceramics to produce different kinds of sound. And the sound really correlates with the word or the symbol on them. And I, I think of them as sonic protest signs. Um, most of the rattles have text or symbol that can be used in different protest situations. And I've used them 
to support a variety of causes from environmental justice to immigration policy reform um, and I see them as intersectional objects. This photo was taken during a rally called Bands Off Our Bodies in May of 2022. The protest took place in downtown LA um, after the publication of the leaked opinion from the Supreme Court that overturned Roe v. versus Wade. I organized a group of friends and colleagues for the rattle action. And it's always so fun to use this rattle with a group of people because everyone's so particular and interested in choosing the perfect one for them, with the message that resonates and the sound that resonates with them. And although using clay for the rattle head makes them fragile, I actually think this is a really an asset for the sculpture because the rattles share a vulnerability with the human body um, protesting on the street, which is a dangerous act. Um, and you're literally putting your, your body on the line. Um, and also the ceramic component connects them to everyday life, to like the cups, plates, and bathtubs that we use. So I like this link between the political and the personal domestic ritual. Um, many of them are really loud, and which is empowering in a group sitting and kind of creates like a sonic shield uh, or a safety net. And um, they can also be used as very effective defense weapons to go back to the introduction, which is not my conscious intention when making them, but it's definitely, it's there in the object. Uh, and it was so interesting to me during the ban off our bodies rally, um, many people in the group ran up to these radical right counter protesters and just shook these rattles as hard as they could and totally drowned out their, um, their voices. And so it really went back to the DNA of the piece to like drowning out the name of Haman, which I loved. This rattle project has gained some national press. And so people from around the country and the world started contacting me about making their own protest rattles. And here is a set of ceramic rattles that a potter in Pennsylvania made with her community. And as you can see, their form and their messaging is very different than mine. But I love how they represent those voices and those bodies and those interests. And you know the politics of each place are so different the politics of California and Pennsylvania are very distinct from each other. So, um, so I think these reflect the politics of that space. Um, and then this community has used the rattles to um, raise money, also for protests. I just wanted to share an example of how my sculptures start. So most of them start as line drawings. Um, and uh, here's a drawing I made for a series that I was dreaming up called Blame Game Rattles. Um, I started thinking about this artwork after an epic argument with my dad over the state of Israel. Most of my family supports an Israeli apartheid and I do not. And this is an issue that divides many Jewish American families. So I haven't spoken about Israeli politics since <laughs> this argument. <laughs> um, but afterwards, I was ruminating, thinking, mulling over how the act of blame, um, blaming something or someone reflects back um, onto the blamer, the person doing the blame. And so I was imagining this sculpture that had like pointing fingers everywhere um, in every direction. So here is one of the blame game rattles. Um, this one's called Condemnation from 2018. I created this, these pieces with ceramic slip casting, which is an industrial process used to make sinks and toilets and mugs that we use every day. Um, and I cast 44 individual index fingers from my community and made molds of each of the fingers. Um, this was actually my first time using ceramics um, and I was working with a mentor and they were just like you're crazy just make one finger and 
just make multiple casts of that finger. And I was like, no, they all have to be different. <laughs> and then after like months of making these slip cast molds, I really understood what they meant. <laughs> um, but I still love how you look at these objects and each finger is different from a different individual um, and different body. Uh, so I envisioned these rattles to be used in rituals and performances. They're probably the most witchy piece that I've ever made. Um, and I, I just really appreciate their cre creepy, mystical feeling. And I actually come from a long line of Jewish witches and medical in intuitives. Uh, so with some of my sc sculptures, I really feel like I'm conjuring power I want to see in the world. When I first exhibited these pieces, I displayed them with sonic diagrams from the Renaissance scholar Athanasius Kircher. Um, he is credited uh, for inventing the megaphone. Uh, and also, he had an early wunderkammer, um, which is like um, an early version of a museum, like a cabinet of curiosities. Um, he wrote many, many different books um, about science and religion, and two of his books are about sound. And um, so this diagram is from one of his books, and this particular diagram maps um, what he, the way that he's theorizing sound moves through a snail shell. This is, um, this image shows more of the blame game rattles reinstalled. And they each investigate different points on the continuation between blame and accountability. Um, so one of them, you can see um, this one has fingers pointed toward the sky for those who look towards the heavens for answers. Um, this one is made of um, fingers from female identified bodies and it's kind of like a meat tenderizer. Um, and this one is a rattle that I call us versus them. It has two fingers pointing in different directions. This is actually the loudest one of all of them. Um, the fingers, they, m they actually muffle the sounds of the rattle. So more fingers, the quieter the rattle. And this makes a really interesting sonic argument. So the rattles that have um, more fingers to complicate the act of blame have a harder time making their point and being heard. While the rattles that have a very simplified configuration of blame, um, like the us versus them rattle, have a more obnoxious and virulent sound. So the sounds of the rattles, I feel like, really reflects our political landscape where more subtle, more complicated perspectives get lost in the din of these loud, radical voices. Um, and here's an image of, um, of a performance with the rattles, just to give you a sense of scale in relation to the body. Last year, I made a series of ceramic bowls with cast fingers, which investigated how accountability could look within a community. Uh, I pictured these bowls when reading a quote from the Jewish philosopher and civil rights activist Abraham Heschel, who says, morally speaking, there's no limit to the concern one must feel for the suffering of human beings, that indifference to evil is worse than evil itself, that in a free society, some are guilty, but all are responsible. And maybe some of you will recognize this language because um, Martin Luther King Jr. had like very similar statements about the evil of being silent. Um, and I imagined this bowl, and they were colleagues, they, were, they worked together, Abraham Heschel and um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, I imagine this bowl of fingers participating in group accountability where everyone gets to speak and be heard and be held accountable to one another. This piece is called Self-Portrait as Radical Empath from 2021. It's a print with foil on paper. I was deeply impacted by the protest technology called the People's Mic, which I used while participating in the Occupy movement of 2011. 
um, but the people's mic was invented decades before that. Um, it uses bodies as microphones to amplify voices in a crowd when there's no electronic amplification. And in this image, I am picturing myself as a human megaphone. I found this folk instrument at the Folk Music Center and Museum in Claremont, California when I was um, preparing for an exhibit there. I love folk music um, because it arises from everyday people, often in response to their identities and political landscapes. Folk instruments are often made with um, the materials at hand and they're provisional. And my sonic sculptures share a kinship with this spirit of immediacy. The folk instrument you see here is called a mega kazoo horn, and it was made by folk music promoter and producer Charles Chase, who, for those of you that are into folk music, he's also the grandfather of folk musician Ben Harper. Uh, and Charles Chase was an active socialist. He used this instrument in marches in the 1970s. Um, it's a 10-foot, six-person horn with six siren whistles, so it goes like um, And you can see the siren whistle tubes on either side of the instrument. Um, it's also modeled after a Tibetan horn. Um, and I displayed this mega kazoo horn alongside my own sonic sculptures. But that wasn't good enough for me. I really wanted to make my own. <laughs> and um, so eventually I did. Um, pictured here with similar dimensions. It's 10 foot long, um, also made for six people, but instead of siren whistles, which I'm not that into, um, I made it for six voices. So there's these little tu tubes for people to speak into. Uh, I finished it in the fall of 2020 after the summer of racial reckoning, and I called it, our work is never done, unfinished business. I was really proud of the sculpture because it's the first instrument I've made that includes both listening and speaking simultaneously. So six people that want to use it, they have to actively listen to each other and work together and be a group. Um, and then when I started using it, which was only recently because this sculpture is also a super spreader. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I only started performing with it in this past year, um, but when you're using it, it's actually hard to hear your own voice. Your voice is mixed in with the sound waves of others, and it comes out um, the end in the sonic soup, which in the end of it, the bell is physically far from anybody that's using it. Um, so I love how the horn creates this phenomenon of merging sound and individual to create a communal force. Here you can see uh, hand and fingerprints on the surface of the horn. Um, it's painted a terracotta color, but it looks like clay, but it's actually fiberglass, so one person can pick it up. It's very, very light. Um, I was At the time, I was looking a lot at early cave paintings as reference for the finger and hand imprints, but I was also pregnant with my second child, and I had these little hands pushing at me from inside my body. <laughs> so, um, so that definitely came out in these handprints, which gives the horn a fragility, and it, su it suggests a history of use. In January of this year, I created a collaborative performance with the composer and musician Sharon Shohi Kim for a performance called Hope is a Hammer. Uh, it involved 11 performers and almost all of my sonic sculptures that you've seen. Um, and the, the performance confronted the silencing of women's voices and the struggle for body sovereignty. And um, it offered also some ideas for collective empowerment through um, political theories from Adrian Marie Brown's Emergent Strategy book. Um, and this part that I'm about to show you, I'm going to show you an excerpt of the performance, um, was particularly looking at the behavior of bees as models for collective action. 
Um, and just a note that everything in the performance is choreographed and notated. It's not improvised, even though it might seem like it is. Um, but it was set up to be like a game in which six performers who are all classically trained opera singers are trying to figure out how to use the sculpture. Okay, so let's see if I can. Uh oh, I'm wondering if this is going to happen again. Uh -uh -uh. No, that's not it. Sorry. Okay. No. I'm going to do this. This is just like a excerpt. Um, so some of the sculptures can get really intense, some are more intimate and playful. Uh, this piece is from 2017, it's called Me and You Kazoo. I used casts of my father's pointer finger and thumb for this piece. Kazoos are a type of instrument called a vibraphone. They're one of the first instruments that was ever invented, uh, and they were used uh, to disguise a, a person's voice, like a sonic mask. Uh, and all these early instruments, along with the kazoo, have a membrane that vibrates with when wind is blown against it. Um, so this used to be like something like leather or parchment. Now kazoos use pieces of paper. 
um, here is the kazoo about to be in action. It's made of cast uh, plastic and metal. I always make sonic sculptures that an untrained musician like myself can play, but I adore how professional musicians can produce unexpected sounds from my sculptures and really push them to the limit, like you saw in the last performance. This is a poster um, after a piece by Corita Kent. She's an artist who I often return to, um, and she created a poster in the 1980s with this text. <coughs> uh, and I made this in 2021. It has a quote from economist Barbara Ward, who pioneered theories of sustainable economies in the 1970s. Like she was the one who coined the term sustainability. Um, and the waves in the background of this print allude to the effects of climate change, the rise of sea levels, the drought in the West that we're all experiencing, maybe not this year, but most years, and the increase in severe storms. The poster is embodied by this group action I organized in downtown LA for International Women's Day in March of this year. With all of the recent attacks on women's bodies, both in the US and abroad, um, I really feel like coalition building is vital. Uh, so in this spirit of solidarity, I gathered four feminist collectives together to produce a large-scale action, which we called Lifelines. And these collectives that I work with, I'm just gonna list them and describe them. One of them is called Affirm, um, and it's, a, it's actually a national group that has chapters in different cities, and it's that describes itself as a transnational anti-colonial organization of women of color. Um, another one of my collaborators is called Nisantas. Uh, they are a Latinx collective that works in South Central LA. And um, a third collaborator is Tomorrow Girls Troop, which I already talked about before, that focuses on East and Southeast Asian activism. And finally, the fourth one is She Loves Collective, which is based in the Armenian community of Glendale. So each one of these groups really works with a different ethnic community, and they didn't even know e of each other. Um, and But I knew all of them, so I decided to um, introduce them to each other and work together to create something. Each of the collectives chose a phrase or words in their native, native or ethnic languages, and we painted them on 15-foot banners, which we used on International Women's Day in solidarity with uh, freedom fighters calling for women's rights in Iran. Um, and then we performed this piece again in May of this year with my rattles in a festival promoting healing. Um, and we're continuing to work together to meet and to think of how to expand the project moving forward. Uh, here is a portrait of me by photographer Ken Gonzalez Day, which I call My Body is a Battleground. And um, I'm gonna play a sound piece that I made called Rattle Watch um, that I created in 2022. It's about three, three and a half minutes long. Um, it is a sound piece I recorded of myself playing rattles, and I also used sound from my own personal archive. I'm always collecting sounds and recording sounds. Um, and the piece includes sounds I recorded while live streaming a 2013 protest in Austin, Texas, of an anti-abortion bill, Senate B, um, Bill 5, SB 5. So the, the campaign to um, overturn Roe v. Wade, it's like been going on for so long. Um, so it wasn't a, a surprise to me at least when, um, when the Supreme Court overturned the, the um, precedent. Uh, and during this protest in 2013, a Congresswoman, Wendy Davis, stood on the floor of um, the State House and continuously spoke for 13 hours, 
<laughs> doing a filibuster um, to stall the bill being passed. And she eventually was kicked off the floor, some technicality, but this crowd had amassed in the state house and they started cheering and screaming and disrupting the proceedings. So the bill um, wasn't able to pass that day. Of course, it passed the next day. <laughs> but I just thought, I just was like at home watching it, watching a live stream of it, just totally thrilled um, to just hear and experience this group sound. Um, so you're going to hear some of that sound uh, in the piece. Um, and you're also going to hear a um, part of a speech that I recorded. It's a call and response chant, um, but the chant is from a speech by the um, Black Liberation Army activist Asada Shakur. And this piece, that excerpt I recorded um, in 2017 at a March for Gender Equity. So this is the last piece I'm going to share. So we'll just like end with this sound piece and then um, I'm going to open up space for questions. Okay.
for the convenience of our uh, streaming audience, I um, welcome questions into the microphone and I'll deliver it to you and take it from you when you're done asking. Are there any questions? <clears throat> Hello, I, I really appreciated your talk. We got to see your work at 18th Street Center and that was, oh we were cool. like, oh, what is this? <laughs> um, and a question that I have is for you, what does, what does the space of visual arts offer to sound-based work that like an experimental music space doesn't? Mm -hmm. And then I also sort of have that same question around like what does a visual art space offer that an activism space doesn't? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so what does the visual art space offer that a music space doesn't? Um, well, I guess I wanna start out with saying that galleries are very sonically unfriendly usually, um, and that's something that's frustrating to me <laughs> as someone that works with sound. Um, so I've been in shows where there's like multiple sound pieces playing at once. Um, and it even shows up like when I've tried to bring my son to museums, it's just sensorily so overwhelming for him um, because of his sensory processing disorder. And so I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in many different ways. Firstly, to accommodate sound work in visual art spaces and also to accommodate people with different sensory brains and bodies um, in visual art spaces. But um, I think for me, the making work that combines like visual and sonic, um, I think in images and so um, I, uh, just naturally kind of want to layer these different parts of experiences of life. And that's my experience of being a human too. It's not like I experience sound as separate from anything, you know, like I'm listening to music or I'm listening to um, a podcast or whatever. And I'm always engaging with the visual world. It's not like I'm closing my eyes. So, um, so I'm interested in how like s symbols and um, form and shape uh, and like storytelling um, can add more, more and different kinds of content to music. I think, you know, music history, musicians, I've talked about this with musicians a lot, um, uh, that oftentimes uh, musicians feel like music is not a progressive um, field and um, musicians that are trying to kind of push the envelope and explore different things feel and deservedly so that they're really under recognized and I think that's true. Um, and so um, work that's more political or um, more conceptual is really siloed in the music world. And, um, and so working in this intersection of um, visual art and music is just so super exciting for uh, some musicians, not all. Um, <laughs> but there's just like, yes, finally, people wanna like make more of a political statement or make more of a conceptual statement. Um, so that, that's like one aspect of it. Um, and then in terms of activism, it's so, you know, I've had so many different experiences in activist spaces, like both as an activist myself and um, as an artist in an activist space. So it's been a real evolution since the Occupy movement. Like when I was doing stuff in Occupy LA, there was this whole narrative about me being like this elitist bourgeois that came in with like art ideas about like listening to the 99% and um, you know, they just didn't, a lot of the activists there just felt like, um, and I was a part of a group of 
a lot of artists that were just like so excited about the Occupy movement and so interested in joining. And a lot of the activists um, involved in Occupy just like didn't want to have anything to do with art um, and thought it was elitist. And, um, but now you see a lot of movements like Black Lives Matter that's just like, we are art, we are culture. Like, it's just, they're just like integrating art in different ways. Um, so that's really exciting for me. Um, and, and then a lot of activists are like, how can we use you to further our ideas? Like, they don't want it to be a collaboration. They're just like, you, you create this visual for us. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think, you know, for so, so much of activism is about messaging and about creating like a spotlight on an issue or attention and promotion to something that's going on and art knows how to do that really well. Um, and so I think that's something that art can offer to activism, creating those visual images. Um, but, um, but like I said, there's a lot that art can't offer activism. Like art's really slow. It like takes so much time to conceive artwork and um, the process of art is just like a snail's pace. And um, activists are just like, we need something now. Like we're, or, or this has changed. Oh, we can't use this. It's like the, the, the situation on the ground has changed. Um, and so it's great when, when things can when art and activism can intersect, um, but it doesn't always happen. And, and I also think that like, you know, um, activists have like a really specific agenda, like they want to get certain things done in society. Um, and like, that's very concrete, you know, like we want this law passed. We want this, this situation changed. And artists like don't have that same kind of mandate necessarily. Like it's unless you know you're like joining that campaign, um, you know you're you're you have like different ideas about how art should be in the world. And and I don't think that all art that's political needs to be also functional. So yeah, yeah. Thanks for that question. Thank you so much. That was uh, a really just great presentation and talk. Um, you're talking and then the work itself shows such a deep, um, rich relationship with hands. I'm like so conscious of them myself right now. Um, and just um, the making of the hands, but also um, even just I was noticing with the larger instruments, the way that the singers or the musicians had to sort of use their hands. Um, and just the way that you've presented it, it seems to have like really emerged. Um, I'm just wondering if you could just talk about just what you've, just your own thinking about uh, about this in your work. Yeah, no, that's a, such a good question. And um, yeah, I'm actually making a piece right now um, that I cast of me and my son holding hands. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I mean, um, that's, I have to say, I've thought about that a lot where I'm just like, I'm so interested in hands. They're, um, you know, a way to communicate, like a nonverbal communication tool, um, the gestures, the different ways that people use their hands while talking sign language, you know, signaling, um, hand gestures. So I think that maybe just like a deep interest in human communication has um, drawn me towards hands, but I haven't quite totally figured it out, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Like, why am I so fascinated with hands? Um, I've often thought about, or I thought about when I was a student, I was like, would I rather, this is such a weird thought, but I was like, would I rather be blind or lose my hands? And I was like, I would rather be blind because like, I don't know, hands are just how an artist creates. Um, so uh, yeah, but thank you for that question. I have to like 
think more about <laughs> what fascinates me with hands. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'm really curious about, I love, I love the grogger showing up um, and this whole idea of bringing in your Jewish, I mean, how you bring in these Jewish ritual objects into your work. And there's this sort of reinventing of the object. And I'm curious if the objects show up in a Jewish context in a reinventing of the Jewish ritual. Because a lot of what I saw was um, secular space. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious if there's any um, presence of that in your Jewish spaces. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and it, it's so fascinating to me because I don't, um, <laughs> I don't make these objects thinking like, I'm gonna make something that is based on the grogger. Like I'm gonna make a sculpture based on the shofar. It's only like after I've made it that I realize, oh, <laughs> like duh, that's what I was doing. Um, and so it comes out so subconsciously I have to say that um, I am a practicing Jew. I belong to a congregation. My son goes to Hebrew school. Um, I'm also married to a non-Jew. Um, and uh, But we have a Jewish family. Um, and it's the weirdest thing because I've, um, I have been interested in um, bringing my objects into Jewish spaces. Like once I realized like, oh, these are really Jewish. This work is so Jewish. Um, <laughs> I was like, oh, what if I start showing in Jewish context? Like that would be interesting. But I, I, I don't know what it is. And I'm just gonna be honest, like um, I haven't gotten any bites from <laughs> Jewish spaces. Um, and I, I don't know, I, maybe it's too hard of a leap or something like it doesn't like to um, to make for for Jewish art spaces, um, and I've applied to a ton of like Jewish fellowships and grants and stuff. I never get them. Um, so yeah, I mean, I was kind of recently. I was like, oh, it'd be really cool to make to do a rattle making workshop before Purim this year, um, but I don't. I haven't. I guess I haven't bridged that gap yet. They're kind of, they exist in these different worlds and they haven't yet come together, but I'm still hoping that at some point they will. I think that would be really interesting. Um, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Hasn't happened yet. Thank you. And you can ask me any question also about just like being an artist in the world or what working artist or a parent working artist too. I'm happy to talk about and share my life experience if that's helpful and interesting. <laughs> you don't get that offer very often. <laughs> <laughs> How is the sausage made? <laughs> Okay, well, thank you, Alana. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Thanks so much.